Dr. Hunt's message this morning is entitled, Mission Unstoppable, God's Word, Don't Leave Home Without It. And our text is Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 15, if we would stand together in honor of the Word of God. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God of Berea, they were there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Though the grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Winans, for that fine reading of Scripture. In 1975, uh, American Express launched one of the most successful advertising campaigns in modern history. In fact, it went on for about 20 years. And as it was originally featured, uh, Carl Malden touted the value of Amex traveler's checks and later the Amex prepaid credit card. And of course, Malden used his tough, no-nonsense cop persona uh, from his days on the TV show, The Streets of San Francisco, and he would emphasize the dangers of traveling anywhere without their product, as well as the peace of mind that comes from knowing uh, that you have your Amex in your pocket, sort of the precursor to today's commercial uh, that asks, what's in your wallet? At the end of every commercial, uh, it was always the same tagline, American Express, don't leave home without it. We are in the middle of a sermon series, uh, Mission Unstoppable, examining the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. We have examined the empowerment for mission, the discernment for mission, opposition to the mission. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor uh, Bozeman led us through suffering while on mission. And then last week, Pastor Tweedy giving to the mission. This morning, what to bring with you on mission. In other words, out of all the things you could bring, might desire to bring, wish you could bring, sure would be nice to bring, this text focuses on what is essential to bring, what you would be wise to bring, must bring. And bottom line, when on mission, do not forget to bring your Bible. Don't go on mission without it. Acts 17 is not a tale of two, but three cities. Luke records three places that Paul and those who were traveling with him uh, visit as part of uh, what was known as his second missionary journey. And he's traveling on what was then known as the Ignatian Way. It was constructed, a road constructed in the second century BC. It's part of an ancient freeway system, if you will. It was built uh, by the Romans to link Rome in the west with its colonies in the east, and it covers uh, what's today part of modern Albania, uh, Greece, and Turkey. Originally, when it was built, it was 700 miles long, 20 foot wide. It was paved with large stone slabs. You can see a picture of that, a portion of it that still exists today. What's often missed, though, about this road uh, what's really quite cool or remarkable, if you will, is that the Romans built this road to move their armies around, to move equipment, to move merchandise all around the outer areas of the empire. Paul is using the same road to move the gospel throughout the Roman Empire to strategic centers. So he took a good advantage of the resources of this fallen world and he used them, redeemed them, to advance the gospel of Jesus. The text lets us know that the account begins in Thessalonica. Good news, some people believe, but for the most part, uh, we're told that there were others 
that uh, used their Rent-A-Mob app and they just formed a social media lynch mob. And they threw the city into such turmoil that Paul and Silas had to sneak out of town under cover of darkness. On the other end of Acts 17 is this account in Athens and Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. And again, we're told a few people believed, but most sneered at Paul, especially when he talked about Jesus' resurrection. Bottom line, it says, they dismissed Paul as a senseless babbler. So if in Thessalonica there's this mob violence toward the gospel, Athens was very polite but indifferent to it. In Thessalonica, they are hunted by the mob. In Athens, they are mocked and treated with disdain by the intellectual elites. And smack dab in the middle of this chapter is this account that happens in Berea, so we don't miss it because in Berea, the response was very, very different. So much so that Luke writes, the Bereans were of much more noble character. It's quite a compliment. He's not talking about their pedigree or their social status. He's talking about their heart, their character, and their openness to the gospel. Um, not unlike what uh, we read in Luke's gospel, remember one day when Jesus meets this centurion soldier, this professional uh, man uh, from the Roman army, and Jesus says, I have never found anyone with such great faith in all of Israel. It's that kind of statement. So we're going to look in the next few moments at their receptivity, their research, and their response. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the chance to do this. This is your word. Open it to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Their receptivity to the gospel message. I like that picture. That's just a neat picture. Uh, their receptivity to the gospel message. They are of more noble character because it says they receive the message with great eagerness and enthusiasm. The, the idea behind this word is that of rushing forward. They couldn't wait. They couldn't get enough. They're eager. They're open to what God has to say to them. And Paul uses his sort of standard operating procedure. Uh, we know, as the text says, as was Paul's custom, whenever it, he could, he went to a synagogue first. A number of reasons for that. Uh, none of the least is that any good synagogue in that day, uh, any synagogue worth its salt, would have manuscripts, scrolls. In a day when books were not printed, they were handwritten. Books and manuscripts were all mostly hand copied. So they were very expensive, and Paul went to the synagogue because any synagogue where that salt had copies of the scrolls, at least of the Book of Moses. And so also as part of that custom of the day, any synagogue would also let a visiting rabbi come in and speak. It's a privilege Jesus used to great advantage during his own earthly ministry. So Paul's strategy, if you will, centers around uh, using the scripture uh, with people who are open and receptive. And so as he did earlier, the text says he reasoned with them. He explained, the word uh, is the word we get our English word dialogue, much like Jesus did on the Emmaus Road where we're told he opened the scriptures to them. Uh, Luke says he proved to them, he carefully answered their question. All these different words convey uh, that Paul did so in a very respectful, well thought out, understandable manner. Uh, as James Boyce said, he did not try to coerce them. He certainly did not try to entertain them. He simply preached Christ from the scripture. And so Paul looked for receptive people and tried to point them to Jesus. They were receptive. They went with great eagerness and open, hungry, thirsty, longing in their soul for something that would satisfy. When I was in seminary in 1845, <laughs> there are people here who probably younger ones who would believe that if I told that to my students in the school. Um, I used to work midnights as a security guard, and uh, so I'd go to work at midnight, midnight to eight, then I'd go to school from eight to four, come home, say hi, I'm your husband, I'm your dad, we'd have dinner, I'd go to bed by six, up at 11. Some of you have gone through that routine. And so during the night at work, I was a security guard, and it gave me a lot of time in the middle of the night 
when nothing was going on to study. In the morning, uh, people would start coming into the plant. They had to sign in at this little booth, and my desk was there. And one morning, because I had been working on my Hebrew, which, by the way, is that's not a great strategy at four in the morning. You just cannot remember Hebrew verb forms in the middle of the night. At least I couldn't. And one of my visitors one morning was a guy by the name of Maury. Maury was Jewish, and Maury was intrigued because he's signing in at the desk at the tape. And he's looking over, and he notices my open Hebrew Bible on my desk. Now, this is back when I could read one out of every ten words in the text. And, but he's fascinated because you know what he's thinking, and he's wondering, what's this Gentile boy doing with that Hebrew scripture? And he didn't say anything. And over the months, we got to know each other. And every morning, he'd sign in. We'd say hi. We'd talk a little more. And we got to know each other over time. And eventually, one day, he brought me his copy of the Law of Moses, first five books of, of what we call the Old Testament that was given to him on the day of his bar mitzvah when he was a young boy. Now, this man is in his 70s now. And I thought to myself, self, he's receptive. He's open. And so along the way, uh, we continued that conversation. And one day, I decided to press it just a little bit further. And uh, I, I came, he came in one morning and said, Maury, Maury, have you ever realized how good the book of Ruth is? It's fantastic. We're studying this in class. It's so cool. And Maury's looking at me like, really? I said, have you ever thought about the fact that you got this woman, Ruth, a Gentile Moabite Goyim, who somehow comes to faith in Israel's God and becomes a believer in Israel's God. And the rest of the text lets us know that she marries into the line of David, your greatest king. I said, isn't that cool, Maury? And Maury said, I always thought that's how it was, that God cared about Gentiles too. I lost track of Maury, but the point of that story is simply this that Paul did the same thing. He looked for people in his daily contacts who were receptive. And then he tried to build bridges in terms of the gospel. This is what Aletta Wald in her book called The Joy of Discovery. How about you? How about me? When's the last time you had that kind of an ache or desire or longing in your soul? How thirsty are you this morning? How eager are you? How open are you to what God is saying by His Spirit through His Word? Have you come this morning with any expectation of meeting God? And how much prayer, how much soul preparation have you done before coming this morning? Before coming this morning. Not only for yourself, but for the person tasked with preaching on any given Sunday. They received the message with great eagerness. They also researched, they examined the text, says the scriptures, every day to see if what Paul said was true. If you're going to commit your life to something, you better make sure it's truth before you do so. So they're not only receptive, they research this as well. They're eager to hear, but they, then they carefully examine it. There's a humility to these folks in the way they handle God's word because they're willing not only to master the book but to be mastered by it as well. They examine, they search, they study, they ask questions of Paul. Not to pick holes, not to look for ways to ignore it or dismiss it or rationalize it away, but to confirm the validity, the truth of the claims again before they commit their lives. They compared scripture to scripture, line on line, and they did so in a group. Every day it says, day after day after day, in order to see if what Paul said was true. They examined the scriptures. That word is used in the New Testament of judicial investigations. Very careful, methodic investigations. It's used of the way that Herod examined Jesus. It's also used in the end of Acts of the way Felix would examine Paul as well. K. 
Can you imagine how cool this was? I mean, have you ever thought about what this was like to have these people gathered together around a table in a synagogue with Paul and they're examining the sacred scrolls and parchments, probably with their local rabbi and others, but there's this receptivity to the word and a reverence or a humility toward it as well. So it's little reason then that the name Berean is still used even today on churches you know, Berean Bible Church or whatever, Berean Bible Studies. Uh, So the, the word Berean is still used to apply to people who study the scriptures with impartiality and great care. To be, to desire to be like a Berean is still a goal worth striving toward, but to be known as a Berean is even better. So how about you? How about me? Are you in the Word every day, on a regular basis, with a community of faith, other people, studying with other believers? Are you not only examining it, studying it, but do you wrestle with it, what it says? What does it mean by what it says? How does that apply? Moving from the what questions to the so what questions to the non now what questions examining the claims of Christ because your very life, your eternal well-being, hangs in the balance. Uh, My brother Cliff um, left home when he was 16 the first time. He lived most of his adult life uh, by the seat of his pants. Uh, He was sort of a Jacob, uh, if you will. He lived out in the streets most of his life, and by the time he reached 40, that kind of life uh, takes its toll. Some of you understand what I mean by that. And so at some point, he checked himself into an alcoholic rehab unit in a VA hospital in Chicago. Now, if you know anything about those kind of deals, most people don't check themselves in voluntarily. Most folks are told they have to go there by a judge, their employer, by a spouse. My brother realized, that by God's grace, he needed, to, he needed to check himself in, and he did, thankfully. And so when he got out, he called me to tell me about his experience, and I wanted to know what that was like um, because I got this sense that God was bringing the prodigal home. So I asked him, what was that like? And he said, well, every day we had different sessions. You know, every day uh, we'd all meet in this nice big room, upholstered and couches, cushy and lamps in the corners, And every day we had different speakers in this program, 12-step AA program. And as you know, in that program, the first basic step is to acknowledge uh, that uh, you can't do this on your own and you need a, what they call a higher power. And so my brother is in the class. I said, well, what was that like? He said, well, every day, uh, and this is a paraphrase, it was sort of like different speakers. One day it would be like uh, Jerry Falwell came in and taught the class, you know, fire and brimstone and you know, hell and damnation. The next day he said it was sort of like having Bozo the Clown for your instructor, you know. (laughs) You know, kiss a tree. So I said, what was that like? He said, it was crazy. It was bizarre. And at some point, my, the guy kept talking about the need for this higher power and my brother asked the instructor, Bozo, he asked Bozo, That's not very nice, is it, of a pastor? (laughs) He asked this man, so who's the higher power? The guy says, it just depends on you. Whatever helps you, whatever you'd like it to be can be your higher power. My brother asked him, but isn't Jesus the higher power? That guy goes, well, if that works for you, yes, but for somebody else, it'll be something different. And my brother looks over in the corner and there's a lamp with a lampshade. Now you have to know the hunts. Being a charm bomb is not part of our spiritual uh, gifting set. And my, I can't tell you what my brother said because I still like to work and I don't plan on retiring yet. <laughs> but this is a loose paraphrase. My brother looked at this guy and said, so you mean to tell me that lampshade could be my higher power? He says, yeah, if that works for you. And my brother looked at the man and said, you are a bigger fool 
than I am, although that's not what he said. Something about donkeys or something. <laughs> you see, these people were not only, they were receptive to God's word, they opened it. They researched the word. They examined it to see if it was true. Because like my brother who came to realize because of God's grace, if you are going to give your very life and entrust your eternal well-being into something, it better be true. They were receptive. They researched it. And they also, uh, their response, they received. They were open. And they opened themselves up to the word and they responded in faith. It says many believed. In other words, unlike all these other places on either side, a whole host of people uh, believed and came and responded to faith. So like the parable of the sower and the soul, soils, God opens up their hearts. He plants seeds of faith in there. And in this town, in this synagogue on this day, God opens up a lot of hearts and the seed bears fruit. It landed in the hearts of many. And in fact, it goes on at the end of that verse 12 to say, and many Greek men, literally not a few. In other words, they were astounded at the number of men who responded. And so not only was a brand new church birthed on that day, but their men's ministry had a great start as well. And of course, more importantly, much like the Philippian jailer that we heard of a couple of weeks ago, in that day, if the husband came to faith in Christ, that meant then the entire household would follow suit and come to saving faith as well. And so to be known as a Berean was a testimony to Christ in that town and eventually around the world and down to our day. They were receptive to God's word, they researched God's word, and they responded to God's word by faith. Kent Hughes, a pastor, tells a story of a friend of his, in fact, a pastor friend of his. T typically, that's the only friends we have are other pastors. It's part of the weirdness of the profession. And um, he had a pastor friend who was at this nice restaurant one day. And the waitress came over to the table and he struck up a conversation with her and uh, came back and forth a few times. Uh, it was a slow day apparently, but at the end of the, end of the meal, she came over and he says, I, I wanna ask you a question. He asked her, he said, have you made the wonderful discovery of knowing Christ personally? Isn't that a marvelous way to put that? You know, we ask people, you know, would you like a root canal? He said, have you made the wonderful discovery of knowing Christ personally? And in the conversation, she indicated she had not. And then, of course, she started making excuses, which is the normal way this works. Uh, she said she couldn't get to church on Sunday because she worked, which in fact was true. But she said she also had a hard time uh, because she didn't have a Bible in her own language, and she was Romanian. And so after, the, after a little while, the pastor was going to give her a tract, a tract called or entitled The Four Steps for Peace with God. But he reached in his pocket and discovered he didn't have one with him. So he took out a napkin and he wrote out the four steps to finding peace with God on that napkin. He gave it to her, paid his bill, went on his way, and after he left the restaurant, looked up and bought a Romanian translation of the Bible. Then he made sure he got it to the restaurant and gave it to her. Some months later, he comes back to the restaurant for a meal. She sees him coming in the door. She waves at him. She makes a beeline for his table, and she thanks him for the Bible. She lets him know she's been reading it from cover to cover. In fact, she says, some nights I just stay up all night long reading my Bible. And better than that, she said, I've come to know Christ as my Savior. Then she pulls out the napkin out of her pocket, and it's all tattered up. It's all in shreds. And she said, would you take another napkin, please, and put those four steps on it for me? I've shown this napkin to so many people, it's falling apart. You see, the Word of God had just turned another life upside down. 
being receptive to it, researching it, and responding to it. Planning on going on a mission for God anytime soon? Well, here's a newsflash. If you're a Christian, you already are on mission for Christ, whether we realize it or not. So whatever you're going to do, whatever you're going to take with you, remember one essential truth, to remember your Bible and don't ever leave home, don't ever go on mission without it. And who knows? You might even hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful Berean. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness in giving as a gift this day and this time, this place, your word and the opportunity to hear your voice, to be open to it, and to respond to it. We pray by grace in Jesus' name. Amen.